and once they got wind that this was happening, they came after me with ferocity. Hi, I'm Ari, and this is Beyond the Box with Sneaker News. My mom, she was like an arts and crafts person, so I was always making like crazy stuff of screen printing my own shirts, anything I could figure out. You know, there's no YouTube at that point, so I would learn something and do something. And uh, at, at one point, like in 1988, um, De La Soul and other people, you know, groups, people would reference that, but just basically people in hip hop started wearing these Africa medallions and some other medallions that were getting made. Um, and down in Philly at the time, we couldn't really, they weren't selling those things, we couldn't get them, and nor did I have the money, so I started making these crazy medallions. At this point I started, I was drawing like all sorts of things, um, and so I was doing some people's logos, I was doing these medallions, the medallions gained momentum, that kind of gave me, gave me some attention. I started doing uh, hand-painted rhinestone jackets and stuff, and like all this crazy kind of classic hip-hop, you know, late 80s type stuff. Um, and a couple of people told a couple of rap groups, a couple of rappers uh, about my medallions, like showed or told them I made medallions and jackets for them. They then went and took them to record labels. From the record labels, people started asking me for medallions and I started doing logos. Um, that got me into uh, Rough House Records. At the time it was independent and Rough House Records needed a new logo, they wanted some medallions, and I started having dialogue with uh, Chris Schwartz and Joe the Butcher. They were independent at that point, and soon after I started doing medallions and stuff for them, they got a deal with Sony, and signed Fuji's, Cypress Hill, Nas I think was the first, they had the halftime single before he went directly onto Sony, and so I started doing artwork for all these different, crisscross. that was it. And so I started doing artwork. I designed the new Rough House logo, started doing artwork for Criss Cross, and then the medallions and the other stuff I was doing got attention, got me attention in New York. And the next thing you know, I got a call from Play, from Kid and Play, and he had me come up to New York and start designing stuff up at his shop. I think it was in Queens, if I remember correctly. And it was like, you know, Big Daddy Kane and Salt and Pepper. I started doing Salt and Pepper medallions, and that kind of got me in, into the industry. And I had known Steve um, Espo from, from 85, from graffiti days. And Steve had this newsletter um, that was like a graffiti zine. And then around that time when it dropped down, me and Steve were talking and Steve was like, I want to turn this into a full-fledged magazine. And the only thing around at that point was the Source magazine, which was huge. And, the, and that one of those dudes was a Philly dude that I knew. And me, I still had dreams of doing more stuff in the music industry. And I had gotten a, like right around that time, I had gotten a job from a friend of ours, uh, Tramp, who, who had been given uh, the, abil uh, or the opportunity to do the artwork for the first Roots album, just Do You Want More? And uh, so he came to me on the production level with an idea, and we sat there and collaborated and talked over some ideas and did that. And right around that time is when Steve and I really started to work on the magazine more, more aggressively. He was working in a copy shop, I was working in a stat shop, which is like a copy shop, like a Kinko's, and we were just sneaking in there at night and working on the magazine. And uh, at the mean, in, in, in the meantime, Kenny over here, who was uh, on and off vacation with the state, <laughs> um, we were always talking about sneakers. Uh, and so there was a sort of convergence of like, the fashion end of it, me doing jackets and medallions and stuff, and Kenny was always down for me that way, and us doing graffiti and that influence and the music industry and sneaker. Um, us, me and, me and Kenny were the only sneaker culture there was for us. We didn't know anybody else even gave a fuck or even would talk about sneakers. And we moved the magazine up to New York. Um, and Steve went up first, and then I moved up later on, like maybe six months later or something like that. And here we were kind of in the position, these outsiders in New York, into sneaker culture, into hip hop, into graffiti, not a part of New York. We knew some of the key players, Fuge and Stash, and these guys were friends of ours through the magazine, but we didn't really know anybody else except for the few people I knew in the music industry. Sneaker culture is, I guess it's still very much a thing. It's, 
It's interesting because it, as someone put it back then, that sneakers were the new baseball cards. For me, what really got me into it was really an accident. When I was a kid, I lived in LA for a while. Um, and in LA, the Vans used to have, you know, Vans, as in Van Doren, used to have stores called Van Doren stores, Van stores, and they were a local brand. And you would go to the store and you could customize your sneakers. You could literally go to Vans and choose, they had rings of material. And it could be this material, this color, that. They had Hawaiian print, the checker, the popular, you know, classic Vans checker. That process, I was like eight years old. This is 1978 or something like that. And it was so incredible to me that it made me pay attention to sneakers, which I probably never would have, honestly. Oh, I can see, I can see through there already. I like your box, man. You gotta hook me up with one of these for sure. Oh, okay. You guys, you guys did your homework. Wow, look at that. These I do see from time to time. I don't own a pair. I, I, it's illegal for me to own a pair, so um, part of a settlement agreement. The project, it was, so, it was sort of an evolution. After, we, uh, after I helped Steve do the Air Force Two um, with Nike, Steve continued to have dialogue with Nike, um, and it never really bore fruit. They wanted him to do sort of colorways and minimal stuff. They were giving him some freedoms, but nothing to the level that he had before, and we were like, I guess a little frustrated with that process, um, because it wasn't about the money, and the rep just didn't seem, at the time there was no social media, so the rep didn't seem to be that worth it. On the West Coast, people really smoked cool cigarettes, and on the East Coast, it was Newport. And immediately, the Air Force One, you really didn't, you didn't pay attention to Nike much before that. You know, Jordan kind of, even the Jordan One was not popular, especially those colors were not popular colors at that time. So I remember at one point just putting two and two together and just being like, oh, that's the, I don't even think we called it a swoosh or anything. I think I probably said the Nike symbol was the same. And that just went into the back of my head. So then getting back around to talking about the marketing company and stuff, after working through the Nike process and not being able to be creative with my clients, seeing Steve's frustration, knowing that that was there, to me it was like, well, trying to discuss with them sneaker culture, the significance of doing something limited and small that would then shockwave out, not only in the city, but into the suburbs and become this valuable, it would become a word of mouth value that no billboard could, could handle. Obviously, they, you know, Nike would never do something this controversial, combine their, you know, their athletic philosophy, their sports philosophy with cancer. Um, and for me, this wasn't, it wasn't about that. For me, it was that I saw the same thing. And I didn't see a lot of differences in the way that they were being marketed. Uh, I didn't smoke and I'm anti-tobacco and my mom has since died from complications to tobacco and my sister has uh, had severe complications from smoking as well. Um, but what I wanted to prove with this, um, besides you know, making something cool, was that Nego had proved something that if you build it, they will come. And prior to Nego, no one would dare venture off the three top brands. It was you know, Nike at the top, Adidas, and Puma. So for me, it became, okay, I wanna do an art piece, but who's gonna pay attention? I'm involved in the sneaker world, they'll pay, they'll pay attention first. I knew that many people would see it as this ghetto fabulous kind of thing or this novelty or be anger, angered by it, which is dialogue I really wanted. So it was really about two companies that have very similar marketing pro, uh, processes. They both market to the inner city as well as the suburbs in their limited ways. Nike uh, at that point depended, I think like 70% of their business was through uh, Foot Locker. Foot Locker liked to heavy up their ads on the 1st and the 15th, which is um, when you, know, you get the welfare checks. No one person was wrong or right, but there was a lot of accountability and lack of accountability on many fronts. And I love Nike, I love Adidas, I love uh, Newport for many aspects. And to me, the, the, the dialogue was there that no company was whole and holy, or whole, holy whole, you know? And it seemed to be a metaphor for just who all of us were. 
all of us were trying to be better, but everybody's got a vice. Everybody's got something. And sneakers are a vice. But man, you had to have those sneakers. And I had to have those sneakers. And I wanted this to be a case study in many ways for myself. Because I had been in the marketing business and, and was, it was still in it, I was frustrated. So this was not through my marketing company. This was not through any other process. I took my money, I created a separate LLC, knowing that this would be a problem. I got all my ducks in a row and invited trouble. Nike served me with a cease and desist. Um, word has it that, that the, the top of the top over at Nike really found it flattering and amusing. However, you know, they couldn't endorse it. It's, you know, it's them, it's collaborating them with tobacco. That's just horrible for them. So they really handled it classy and um, it was exactly how I'd expect it. They really had a sense of humor about it and just said, hey, don't do that anymore. I was like, cool, I, I never was gonna do it again. This was one and done. Laura Lard's lawyers are not in-house, they're an out-of-house firm. And once they got wind that this was happening, they came after me with ferocity. And the lawyers, I mean, let's, let's keep it real, they're lawyers because they're out-of-house. Anything they do on the client's behalf is billable. So they came after me every way they could. They looked for conspiracies, global manufacturing, that they, they just swore that I must have had 40,000 of these things somewhere. They asked me if I carded kids. They're lawyers. Again, or out of house. What does that mean? That means they don't, they, they, they're hired by Laura Lord. They don't work for Laura Lord. They work on behalf. So everything they sent me, every email, every letter, every phone conversation, they were able to bill their client. So they called and abused me to death. And they forced me into a settlement because I couldn't battle them. When it was all said and done, I had a settlement um, that, that was, I could no longer own anything, digitally or otherwise. I could no longer uh, own any of these possessions. I had to turn them off. Fortunately, they was all gone. I had the one pair I wore at the time, I think I had another pair, and I had to turn them over to Lorillard's lawyer for Lorillard to destroy, and I bet money that didn't get back over to Lorillard. Any of the sneakers that went, that showed up for less than $250 online, I had to buy and send to their lawyers to be destroyed. Fortunately, that never happened, and I had a feeling it wouldn't. You know, it cost me about almost just under $15,000 in legal fees, which hurt. Eventually, the lawyer stopped, stopped taking my calls, stopped taking my emails, stopped receiving packages. This is before they sold. They just were like, okay, kid, we, we've punished you enough.